Let's pray. Father, uh, we do pray tonight, God, as we look at your word and, and uh, Lord, as we kind of learn more about, I think in this section, more about us than anything else, I pray that, God, you would give us those hearts that desire, Lord, to be molded by you, to be changed. We want to hear from you and we don't want to just, Lord, we don't want to just hear things that necessarily always make us feel good, but I thank you that you're gonna challenge all of us. You're gonna challenge us in this section. You're gonna challenge us to think about the things that we profess with our mouth if we're, if we're living them out and fleshing them out. And so, Lord, I pray again, just give us the courage and the faith to trust you and to walk in these truths. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, last week we left off about taking off the old man, putting on a new man, and when we ended, we talked about holiness and righteousness and how that's kind of a fading thing in the church, I think in the, in the current church and some of the larger church movements that it's just kind of fading away and holiness doesn't matter anymore. And it's just like, am I having a good time in Jesus or not? Now, I think we should have a good time. I think we should have fun, but I think holiness is part of that fun and being changed. So that's the big challenge. And I believe that most of us here tonight that profess to be born again, we would, we would profess that, we would claim that. And then I know one of my favorite verses when I think about that is that I'm a new creation in Christ. And the old is gone and the new has come. And, and I like to think about that, especially when people bring up my past in Bisbee of growing up. Not just Bisbee, we don't want to pick on Bisbee. Bisbee's good. But just that past, and when people, even sometimes some of you meet some people that knew me, and they go, oh, I know him, he's really pastoring. And you think, no, that guy's not, the new guy is. But when we think about that, listen, when we think about that, if we're new creations, are we really living like new creatures? That's the question. Are we living like that old creation? And maybe not in every way, but in a lot of ways. Well, Paul is going to really challenge tonight. I think, I think this is one of the greatest challenges in all of his writings, man. He's gonna, if you really take it to heart, he's gonna push us all the way to the edge and say, is it true or not? Is this who you are? Which side of this do you fall on? And uh, you need to decide, and maybe even after we're done tonight, it might be good to like just go home, sit alone, and take a little inventory. Well, you might, you might ask somebody else, but usually people aren't honest with you. You know, if you have a spouse, you could ask them. They're honest. But, but listen, you can, you can do that. So a couple things, though, before we start. Here's what's interesting. He, he kind of lists, there's three things that really, really stand out. Number one, these all concern relationships and how do we deal with each other and how do we interact with each other. And here's the thing I love. We talked about righteousness and holiness last time. That's not some mystical thing. It's a practical thing that we live out with each other. And how do we do that? And once again, we can't be the church if we're not gathering together, if we're not coming together face to face and rubbing elbows and, and you know, kind of kind of making each other mad and aggravating one another and, and doing those things. Listen, that's healthy. I think it's okay if we desire to work through those. And we want to get, you know, some of the edges chipped off. So, so number one, they're all about relationships. And again, God doesn't want us living in isolation. And then each principle has a negative prohibition, don't do this or stop doing this, along with a positive of do this. So take this off, put this on. Kind of like when you change your clothes, you know, and doing that thing. And then lastly, each principle in each principle, there's a reason given. He's telling us why he's saying this and what's going on. That's why I love this little section. Short section, but man, there is packed full of challenges for us. So once again, you know, he said, put on the new man, and the new man was according, uh, created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, right, verse 25, where we're gonna pick it up, therefore, putting away lying let us let each one of you speak truth 
with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So here's what he says, man. We need to put away lying. Now, I think a lot of us go, oh, dude, I don't lie. Well, you just lied. <laughs> you know, you kind of do that, and you're going, well, now you've covered that, so you're doing it. And he says, listen, though. He says, we got to put that away. we got to think about being honest and truthful, even, hey, I think more people lie in this one area than any place else. It's this organization called the IRS. Yeah, a little busting going on, huh? We all love filling out that tax form, don't we? And we, you know, and we do those things. It's a challenge, right? It's a challenge in our world. And, and so we got to think about that. And, you know, and, and some of us, we justify that by saying, well, the government won't use my money right so I can lie to them. No, you can't. You know, and he says we need to put off lying. And here's the thing, I, I love the whole idea. We need to think about that. We need to think about, hey, do I ever exaggerate things? You know, in Christianity, we call it evangelistically speaking, right? <laughs> we kind of stretch it out a little bit, and that's okay. And, and listen, that's still, that's lying. And we have to be careful, and we have to watch that. Now, he says, listen, he says, we need to put that away. I like that idea. You need to, like, put it away from you and get it away, and then he says, listen how he, he says this, he quotes Zechariah, he says, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, and that's coming out of Zechariah, but then he gives us this challenge, for we are all members of one another. Wow. We're part of this thing called the church, and the church in the Bible, ecclesia, coming together, called out ones, is all that means, those who are called out, and we come together as the body of Christ. That's what we are. And again, I don't think we kind of think deeply enough about that. You and I are part of the body of Christ. And he says, why would one part of the body lie to another part of the body? That just does not make sense. And yet sometimes we do it and we, we think we're getting away with something. Would you like it if your foot lied to your eyes? Or how about worse, if your eyes lied to your foot? It's okay, man, just step in that. That's fine, you'll be fine. <laughs> or how about, how about if your hand lied to your brain and nervous system and you grabbed a hold of something hot, and your hand said, it's not hot, it's okay. Just keep holding on to it. But, I mean, you know, that's kind of foolish thinking, but that happens to people. You know, leprosy, listen, leprosy isn't, isn't a disease that eats away. Leprosy kills the nerve endings so that then people begin to touch things and do things that begin to rot their flesh and damage their flesh. So that's what happens. So listen, we need to think about that and again, scripturally, when we think about lying scripturally, the Bible's pretty clear about liars and where they go, right? Here's a, couple, here's a couple passages if you're not real sure about that. You can look these up for homework. Psalm 116, Revelation chapter 21, 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 6. Man, you read some of those and you go, uh-oh. And we need to think about that and we need to think about our own lives but I think more importantly, our lives with each other. Saints, are we being honest with each other? Are we being real with each other? Are we taking off the facade and, and, and uh, stopping the pretending and stop, stop acting like everything is just fine and being open and honest and speaking the truth with one another? Now sometimes, listen, sometimes speaking the truth can be painful. It can be painful for the truther the spe person speaking the truth, but it might be painful for the one you're telling the truth to. You know, they, you may have to be honest with somebody and say, hey, I'm seeing this, or you may have to be honest and say, this is what's going on in my life, and I want you to know so you can hold me accountable so we can do those things. You kind of get his point. Listen, he's wanting to build us up. Paul in no way is wanting to tear down. He's wanting to build up, and the only way we can build up is by becoming an honest group of people by being the body of Christ 
and not lying to one another. We're all in this thing together. So the first thing he covers is lying. That's kind of that's tough, and it doesn't get any easier. Listen, it gets a little bit harder, right? Verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Once again, quoting the Old Testament, and do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So now it gets a little bit more difficult, right? He's saying to us, there's this such a thing as righteous anger. And you know, I hear some people say, well, I just have righteous indignation. No, you don't. You're just mad. I got mad today about something, and I get, I get mad, and I start spewing and doing stuff, and I think, why am I doing that? You know, I got mad last Friday and yelled at somebody on the phone, and it wasn't their fault, and she kind of told me. <laughs> so that's okay. But listen, we got to think about ourselves, and he says, he says listen, I, I think very, very seldom do we have righteous indignation? And one way to test is, am I mad because it's gonna affect me? And I'm, am I mad because it's coming at me, et cetera? Or am I angry because it's defacing the Lord or, or you know, doing something? That's righteous indignation. But most of us, most of us, we're just mad for ourselves. And he says, listen, he says, so, he says, be angry and don't sin. So there is such a thing as being angry and not sinning, but I, I'm not gonna dwell on that a lot because I don't think many of us are in that camp. I think many of us are in the camp of anger and sinning together and we go that direction. We do that and we need to watch that and I think especially, and maybe it's just me, maybe I'm doing this for me, especially just the last 10 days I've had is like just people, not you guys. <laughs> of course not, it's just people. So, we need to watch out. And here's what he's saying. What would somebody say if they knew you were a believer? Hmm. I remember years ago, this was hilarious. Years, it was a long time ago. And we'd just been on the radio a few years and stuff. And I got a, and this was back when we all still had landlines. Remember those things when your, your phone, you actually have a phone in your home? And, uh, uh, we got some we got some robo call and I answered it and and uh, this guy's like going off and I'm just ready to start screaming at him like why did you call me shut up shut. and I said something and he goes Pastor Pat is that you <laughs> oh 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 I said oh God thank you for keeping me not doing that man because I was just about ready to give him an earful and I go uh huh. Jesus loves you and so do I. Thank you for calling me. I'll buy whatever you're selling. But we have to be, listen, I, I believe there are times I've been, in, I've been in Walmart talking to my wife and people don't even see me, they recognize the voice. Pastor Pat, is that you? And they're like three aisles over and then I have to think, what was I saying? Man, I hope I wasn't yelling at Gaynell. I hope this was good, right? So listen, some of us have a, a, a more of an accountability thing, but we need to be people, hey, we need to be people that when people look at us, they see Jesus. And we need to walk that way and not have that, that anger. And listen, some of us are living with that, and we need to just get rid of that. And he says, listen, then he says, don't let the sun go down. Now, here's what somebody wrote. I cracked up. Somebody said, hey, if you don't want the sun to go down on your anger, you can move in one of those far, far northern countries where it stays light for like, you know, three months in a row and you don't have to worry about the sun going down. And I thought, this, that's us humans, right? We're always gonna find a way to get around this thing. And listen, he's not talking about literally the sun setting. He's talking about don't hold it in, don't have that. And, and here's the biggest thing that I personally fight is revenge. For years before I got saved, I boasted about, and I would tell people, man, it takes a lot to make me mad but when I get mad, it's forever. Oh, isn't that ugly? That's ugly. I, I, you know, I hear myself say that now, and I think, how could God save that person, you know, that spewed stuff like that, that would do that? And I would tell people that, don't make me mad. You make me mad, it's forever. You're gonna pay for it. 
And listen, man, this is what he's talking about, about, about not doing that. And what is he saying, man? Don't, let, don't give, give, or nor give any place to the devil. Nor, you know, I call it giving him a foothold. You start doing stuff like that. You start holding that in. You're opening yourself up. Because you know what? He is going to use that in your life to ruin you. I believe with all my heart, man, the only thing the devil wants to do is kill, steal, and destroy. And I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying he's gonna come in and possess you and you're gonna go bonkers and not do it and he's gonna make you do things you don't wanna do. He's going to use the things in your life that are your weakness to bring you down. Again, I'm not talking about losing your salvation. I'm talking about losing your witness and not being a person who's holy and righteous to our community and the people around us. What does the world think of Christianity today? You don't have to answer that, but it should be a shining light. But what does the world think? And we need to be careful. Now, Romans chapter 12 talks a lot about that, and you can read that. Romans chapter 12 highlights the whole idea that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Just give it to him. And isn't it good? I wish, I wish I could tell you guys, every time I get upset, I go, God, it's your problem. But I don't. One of my favorite passages is when they come to, I think it's Hezekiah, and they come and they're going to attack him. And they send a letter. And he gets the letter. And remember, he goes to the temple and he lays the letter out and he goes, God, this is your problem, not my problem. I love that, huh? And that's how we need to be. Listen, don't let it get you so uptight. Just tell God it's, you know, hey, you need to deal with it. Now, some of this stuff we bring on ourselves, but listen, man, he said, do not give a place to the devil. Every time I get mad, I pray that that would go in my head. Oh, you're giving the devil a place, man. Stop, slow down. Do a rewind, do a reset, change my thinking, change what I'm doing. And the greatest place to practice that is at home with your spouse. And when your spouse makes you mad, when my daughter was younger and she used to get mad, and, you know, I'm trying to raise her, so I'm trying to do the right thing. So I would just tell her all the time, Leah, no sense in getting mad because you're going to have to get glad in the same pants you got mad in. <laughs> and I had, Gaynell and I lived with her for a while when we were building our house, our last house, and we were living with her and we came to her house and she goes, Dad, I have a few rules. <laughs> I'm going, okay. And she goes, rule number one, something that I had a bad habit of doing, you don't do that in my house. Okay. Rule number two, no getting glad in the same pants you got mad in. You cannot say that in my house. But isn't it true? Why, do, why should we get all mad? We're just going to have to change. Getting mad, have you, are, are you guys with me? When you get angry and you blow it, does it ever resolve anything? No, it usually complicates things and escalates them. So listen, once again, you're giving the devil a place and he's coming in. Now, so we dealt with lying. We dealt with anger, right? Now we're all good. We're on a good roll here, right? We're gonna be, man, we're gonna be these people. We're gonna care about one another. We're gonna not lie to each other. If I come up to you and I say, how you doing? Don't you give me that fake, phony Christian smile and say, everything's fine if you're hurting inside. Don't do that. So we're not gonna lie. We're not gonna get angry, right? We're gonna watch it, we're gonna be careful. We're not gonna let, you know, let the sun go down on that. We're gonna be good with each other. And then now we come to the next one. And I don't think too, much, too many of us do this to one another, but he says, let him who stole still no longer. Now I kind of love this, listen. These are kind of Paul's, and I, I kind of imagine, here's Paul in prison, like thinking of things that, that are obviously beset us and maybe there are even things that he's kind of dealing with in prison right I mean if I'm sitting in a jail cell I'm going to be mad especially if I'm in a jail cell and I'm innocent it's going to be hard not to be angry and so I'm wondering if some of this is going through his mind and he says hey if you're a thief stop it don't do that now most of us are going duh once again I R S Or how about this, cheating on your time card? 
Or how about you're supposed to work so many hours and you don't even work for somebody that has a time card, so now you're free and you cheat them. That's stealing. How about taking something home from the office? It's just a paper clip. It's not yours. You stole it. When, when I got drafted, I remember we went into, I went to Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. I called it Misery. We got there about, it was like, it was like two or three in the morning when we got there. We're filling out all of this paperwork. They're screaming at you and yelling at you and you haven't slept and you're filling out this paperwork. And uh, the main thing I remember from that night was those little black pins. We have them here on the agape boxes. Those little black pins that say property of the U.S. government or they just say U.S. government. And I remember them saying, if you steal this pin, we will prosecute you. I put my pin down. And I believed them. Then I start pastoring in Sierra Vista (laughs) on our agape boxes. Those pins start showing up. I go, you guys are a bunch of thieves. I didn't put them there. You're taking them from the U.S. government. I'm going, you're going to go to jail. Because <laughs> I believed them. I believed that they were going to come after us. And, and I come here and I like panic. I go, we got to get rid of those. But see, little things like that we think are okay. And they're not. And we sort of justify it. Now listen, I know, I know, I think all of us, I think all of us have stolen something in our lives. Maybe you haven't, but I think, I think, I, one, one of my worst things about stealing, I'm not going to tell you everything I've ever stole. We don't have time. But one of the things, I remember, I remember as a little guy, I worked up the courage to steal something. Any of you remember doing that as a young person? Some of you are going, dude, you are weird. I worked up the courage to steal something, and it was at, a, at Woolworths. Any of you remember those stores? Five and Dime, right? And I went in, and they sold little turtles. And I wanted a little turtle bad. And so I worked it out with my cousin. I said, look, I'm going to grab this turtle and run out the back door. And, you know, I'll just meet you in the alley. So I did. And we got in a car. Her mom picked us up. We got in a car. It was dead. It was totally dead. I just cleaned out their turtle thing is all I did. It's like, seriously, I could have gone to jail for stealing and it was dead. I would love to say that broke me. But then I would have to deal with the first verse we read about lying. And we get my, but listen, he, said, he, he says, stop stealing. Now, now, listen, and I think that's important for us to think about, but look at what he says because here's the important part. Let him who stole still no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good. Now listen, let's just stop there. First of all, the Bible tells us we're supposed to work for what we get. And I think that's important. Later on in Thessalonians, Paul writes and said, if you don't want to work, you don't eat. Man, that's something that needs to, I think that'll preach in 2020. It's like, come on. And here's, I love this. Listen, stop being a freeloader. Stop stealing and go to work. Now, I understand there are some people who have things going on and et cetera that they can't work, but there's a bunch of people who are taking advantage of a system that is a messed up system that, bottom line, they're stealing. And they're taking advantage of that. And, and, and listen, he says, go work, and I love this. Go to work, and I love the idea personally. You go work with your hands. In our generation right now, Right now, in Sierra Vista, there are a ton of jobs for people that want to work with their hands. But so many people don't want to work. Talk to a guy who does drywalling. He could hire people all day long. No one wants to do that. Why? It's hard. And they don't want to do that. Plumbers, electricians, working with your hands, and and that's a dying art. If you're a young person today, listen up. You learn a trade, you will always have a job, always. I don't care how bad the economy gets, I don't care if it tanks, people always need plumbers, electricians, drywallers, framers. Why? Because they don't know how to do it. And you're gonna always have a job, so enough of that. But, and I don't think he's just talking about physically working with our hands, we work in many different ways. But he says, listen, you need to go and you need to be 
somebody in culture, in a society that is a producer, and he says, listen, he says, work with your hands what is good. Now listen, because here's the important part. Look at the end of that. That he may have something to give to him who is in need. Oh, you're not supposed to be working for yourself. You're supposed to be working for somebody else. In other words, listen, you're going, Pat, you're just contradicting yourself. You're saying to take care of those in need. I think those who are truly in need need to be taken care of. Absolutely. And we should be the first people in line to take care of those who are in need. If the church was actually being the church and taking care of those who are truly in need, we wouldn't need government programs because the church would be taking care of it. And I think, listen, again, we should work hard to do that. And our objective, I love this idea, our objective in what we earn and what we do shouldn't be so I can advance, so I can gain, so I can get. Our objective should be so I can give more. I know some people who, you know, there are some who have the gift of giving, and that's a fun gift to watch, and not just being a pastor and seeing people do it. But man, when you see someone who truly has a gift of giving, here's what I found. When those people are exercising that gift, and I believe it's a spiritual gift, they can't outgive God. They try. And God just like gives them more. Why? Because he knows they're going to be generous. He knows they're going to do that. And it's great, but all of us, listen, all of us should be generous to an extent. And we should be giving. And again, I'm not saying that you have to give to our church is doing well. I think you should give to our church, and that's a whole different message. But I think we should just be givers. We should be people who are concerned about other people. And he says, listen, so stop sealing, sealing or stealing, and start working and giving and being someone who's, you're a contributor, not a, not a taker. And so he says that. Now, now it gets sticky. I mean, all of that, I think, I think all three of those, we can kind of go, well, I can do that. I can quit lying. Well, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> and I, I'll, I'll deal with my anger. I'll, I'll, I'll have people watch me. And I haven't stolen the turtle in years. So I got that under control. And I think, listen, I really do. I believe these first ones, and then, and then he does this, man. Look at what he does in verse 29. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for the necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Do you hear what he just said? Let no corrupt. Now, here's what's, here's what's weird. That word for corrupt it's more the word, we, we would probably say let no putrid word come out of your mouth. It's, it's like, have you ever smelled something that's been dead for like six days? That's what he's talking about. That's stinky, huh? And he says, don't talk like that. Now listen, he's not just talking. Some people go, well, I haven't cursed in like five years. Well, that's great. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about things that we talk about, things that we share, the way we share with others. How do we make other people feel? When we're around other people, are we building them up like he says, or are we tearing them down and making them feel lower than us? Because after all, we want to be great and we want them to feel terrible. And he says, hey, stop that. Don't let that stuff. I love that idea, man. Set, you know, in, in, in Psalms, the psalmist says, Lord, set my teeth as a guard for my tongue, right? You ever, you ever sit and think about that? And, and especially those of us who like to talk a lot. I found, I'm a talker, I found the more you talk, the more you have opportunity to blow it. I'm very jealous of people who are quiet. I get around quiet people and I go, wow. I bet they, I bet they haven't blown it in like 15 years. And I blow it every 15 minutes. And he says, listen, man, don't let that come out of your mouth. And, and again, do we, do we stop and think about exactly what we're saying to people? And he says, man, three things. Let, let, let it be good and let it be necessary for edi edification. That just simply means building someone up. Caring enough about them to, to put them in that place where you're building them up. And, and I love that idea. And then he says, listen, that it might impart grace to the hearers. If we're the body of Christ, all of us, if we're interacting with each other, 
When you go away from each other, we should feel like, oh man, that was sweet. That felt so good. And again, I'm not talking about conviction because we'll get to that in a moment. I'm talking about there was some sweet stuff went on. Even, even stuff that's hard to hear can be sweet, right? If it's spoken correctly and if somebody loves you and cares enough about you. So I'm not talking about just, you know, lavishing, oh, you're so wonderful, you're so great, you're so awesome, and then you gotta deal with lying again and you're in that position. Listen, I'm not talking about that, but are you really wanting to build others up? Is that your whole goal in life? I believe, listen, I believe one of the main goals of Christianity is to lift people beyond you and give them the opportunity to become greater than you, especially as a pastor. I wanna, I wanna get people past. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna, quote, raise up people to, quote, my level, as some say. I wanna push them up, and I want them to be all that God sees them to be, and he says, man, you need to be doing that. And again, talking to these people, and then he says this, listen, that you may impart grace to the hearers, check this out, and do not grave, grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Here's what he's telling you and I. He's letting us know that, that and, and we looked at this last time, or I'm sorry, Sunday. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. He's the one that sealed us. And the Holy Spirit is living in and dwelling in us and guiding us and directing us. And when was the last time you just sat down and talked with the Holy Spirit? I just thought about do you ever think about the one who created the entire universe dwells in you? Woo! Tell me you have to lie. Tell me you can't deal with anger. Tell me you're gonna be someone who steals. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. And he says, listen, do these things so you do not grieve him. I, I, I like this verse because it gives the Holy Spirit personality or personhood. It really bothers me because I do believe, I believe in some people's thinkings and some ministries, the Holy Spirit's kind of the forgotten God. He's kind of, we, we, we kind of, we, we act like he's something other than him. And some people even call him an it. He's not, God is not an it. And listen, man, I, I, I jotted down a couple things that give him personhood. Check this out, listen to this, and do, do search in your Bible and find out. Listen to this. He has intellect, feelings, and a will. He works, searches, speaks, testifies, teaches, convicts, regenerates, intercedes, guides, glorifies Christ, and directs service to God. He can be tested, lied to, grieved, resisted, insulted, and blasphemed. Don't tell me he's not a person. And he says, don't live in such a way that you grieve the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in our lives to what? To teach us, to guide us, to direct us, and I believe to bless us. And here's what I believe with all my heart. When you're lying and stealing and being angry and have corrupt talk, putrid stuff coming out of your face and you're doing that, here's what the Holy Spirit's doing. He's convicting you. And if, if you're like me, you get to the place and you go, wow, I'm really not like feeling the spirit of God. And it's like, yeah, you are. You're feeling the like, the conviction. And as long as he has to convict you, guess what he can't do? He can't teach you and encourage you and strengthen you. And but he's, gonna, he's convicting you. And I wanna, be on the, I wanna be on the other side of that. I don't, wanna be, I don't wanna be that one where the Holy Spirit is like hammering me. And because and, here's what I found. When I get hammered by the Holy Spirit, you know what the first thing I do? I quit praying. Why? Well, because when I pray, I get convicted. So why pray? And the second thing I do? I don't read my Bible. Why? Because everything I read hits my heart. Why? Because he's saying, come on, Pat, come on, come on. I love you. I'm not going to leave you there. Doesn't feel like you love me. Just like a parent, right? What do we say as parents? This is hurting me more than it's hurting you. Yeah, a liar. <laughs> I used to hate it when my dad said that. He's got a big old honking belt. It's not gonna hurt you more. It's like really gonna hurt. 
And then I heard those words come out of my mouth and I went, wow, how'd my dad get in me? And it's so true, right? It breaks your heart. When you have to discipline your children, however you discipline, maybe you don't use a belt, but however you discipline, it breaks your heart when you're doing that. Do you hear what he's saying here? He's, he's not saying don't make the Holy Spirit angry. What does he say? Don't grieve him. Do you know what grieves God's heart when his children blow it? It grieves him. He's grieving over us. He's not like blowing up angry. It's like breaking his heart. And once again, I don't think it's breaking his heart like, oh, I never thought you would do that. But it's breaking his heart because here's what he said. Thursday night, you just studied Ephesians chapter 4, 25 through 32, and you're doing those things. You read them. You even listened to Pat a little bit, and you got something, and now you're off, and you're, you're not even paying attention. You're breaking my heart. I don't want to break God's heart. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit. So think about that, and, and it's interesting that he sticks that in between, you know, that verse 30 comes between 29 and 31, and I know, I know it's, it's numbers, but, but listen to what he says, because again, it's important. Don't let any putrid word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for the uh, necessary, uh, but what is good for necessary edification, that it might impart grace to the hearers, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness rest wrath, anger, clamoring, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Do you see it sandwiched in between those things of, of grieving him? I mean, grieving him is in between those two things that he's saying, don't do that. And man, when he says this, listen, he brings up anger again, but when he says these things, it's like one builds on the other. Bitterness, man, bitterness will, will rot your soul. And he's saying, don't, man. He's saying, listen, don't do that. And how many of us, how many of us get angry about something and, and we, we just let that bitterness work in? And, and some of us, even when we see somebody, we go, could you ask them to come to a different service? Okay, Christian, sure. We'll get right on that. Why don't you get unbittered? Bitterness, and, and, and you know, then that bitterness works into wrath and anger and clamor. I, I'm kind of getting the idea, man, that this truth kind of turns into kind of a brawl, right? And isn't that what happens? Hey, we may not brawl physically out and out, but we're brawling in our hearts. Saints, if there's somebody you got an issue with, talk to them. Speak to them. I was hanging out with a pastor Tuesday, good friend. And some other people were investigating him kind of. And they were just they were just yakking. Some other people. Like a couple of them got together and asked another guy what was up with the f guy that I was hanging out with. I don't want to give you names. And the guy I'm with said, Why didn't he just call me? Why didn't he just ask me what's up? I'd give him an honest answer. How often do we do that? How often do we, instead of going to the person and saying, hey, oh, what's up, man? Are you mad at me? Are you angry with me? Or are you, why do you do stupid things? I mean, it's okay to ask somebody that. Some people just do stupid things. And if you're a person who does stupid things, you're kind of used to people asking you that so it doesn't bother you. You know, people, people come to me sometimes and they go, why would you do that? And I go, because it's me and I, and I can handle it. He, we need to communicate with each other because if we don't, bitterness, wrath, anger, malice, all of that gets in there. And we may not, again, we may not physically get into it, but spiritually we do. And then here's what generally will happen. We leave the church because I don't want to be around that person. And here's what's bad. We go to a new place, and it's, woo, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And then somebody there does something, and we don't clear it up. We don't talk to them. We don't deal with it. We don't take care of it. And guess what? Bitterness comes in, and the same thing. And the good thing about Sierra Vista, there's like 150 churches. 
So you can hop all around. The bad thing is you don't take care of your heart. And it's not a good witness. I read this, man, and here's what I think. I read those things, and, and especially, you know, I, I, I read verse, you know, 29. I think, man, I, I kind of, I, I can do that. And then I think about grieving the Holy Spirit and then I think about 31 and I think, man, those things happen in my life. I, I allow, again, I allow the devil a place and man, those things begin to happen. And then God says, <clears throat> I always hate it when he clears his throat. <clears throat> and then when he's angry with me, he does my mom thing, Patrick. And he says, Patrick, I thought you were a new creation in Christ. Oh, I am. You're not acting like it. Hmm. <laughs> right? And he gets us. So listen, man. And then, and then look at Paul, man. He puts all of this together. And he says, you need to put that stuff away. You need to get rid of that. And then he gives us a flip side again, like he's often done. In verse 32, he says, and be kind to one another. Oh, isn't it great to be kind to one another? Here's what, you know, Gaynell will always tell me this. You can get more flies with honey than you can with vinegar. And I go, I don't like that saying. <laughs> Be kind to each other. It's, and again, not a hokey, fake kind. If we're truly the body of Christ and we see each other as part of that body, shouldn't we be kind to how can, we, how can we be angry with one? I mean, like, does your body ever have fights? Like, does your hand ever go off on your foot? I mean, I get cramps sometimes. I'm wondering if that's my body, you know. I think that's called age, but, you know. But, I mean, when you think about it, come on, man, we shouldn't be doing that. Be kind. When was the last time you even went out of your way to be kind to somebody in this body? Not even talking about the whole big body, just this body. When was the last time you went out of your way to be kind? Because I think if more of us had that attitude, people, here's what would happen. People would be jealous about what's going on in here. You guys, how come you guys are so nice to each other? You know you're a bunch of flakes. <laughs> yeah, we are. But we're a body of Christ. We're gonna be kind to each other. Not only are we gonna be kind, I love this. Listen, be kind to one another, tender-hearted. Oh. That's hard for some people. When we go back thinking about some of the gifts, and I think about the, especially the gifts there in, in, in Romans when he talks about the person who has that gift of teaching and the person who has that prophetic kind of thing. Man, listen, some of us, we see black and white. And it's hard to be, it's hard to be tender-hearted to people who are not falling in and doing things correctly. Why do you do that? <laughs> because I tried so hard. I don't care. And you gotta be, listen, he says tender-hearted. Now, I do have to say, age does help that. And you get a little bit kinder because you live life a little bit and you realize it's not quite as black and white as it was when you, hey, when you're 30, everything is black and white. And your hair's mostly black. You get over 60, it's mostly white and gray. So, so it's, that's where you change. But listen, are you tender-hearted towards others? That's one of the things I admire about my wife. She is so tender-hearted, and she helps me. I'll, I'll say something. I'll be driving, and I'm, I'm a terrible person to drive with. Any of you talk to other drivers? I talk to them all the time. Moron, what are you doing? And like they'll, cut, they'll, they'll like speed. <laughs> What's the matter with that idiot? Here's Gaynell. How do you know his wife's not really sick and he's rushing to the hospital to take care of her? Ah. Oh. Why would that even cross my mind? He's an idiot driver. What's the matter with you? She always, when we're driving, she's, she's like, I think, I think it's from being around me so long. She's got to like temper down the, the, the rhetoric that comes out of my mouth. But it's always like, and, and you know, somebody will do something and I'll go off and she'll go, well, how do you know this isn't happening, that poor, poor person? I'm going, just stop, woman. <laughs> tender-hearted. Are you tender-hearted towards people? 
And then, and then listen, this last thing, he says, and here's the big one, man. This is it. This is where, this is where Paul kind of gets you and he goes, boom, man, right? He delivers that last blow. And listen, he says, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Ah, oh, oh. seriously, Paul? Seriously? Like you're gonna pull that card? You're gonna put that one out there? Yeah, I just kind of wanted to get you. I thought you were a new creation. I am. Well, the new creation would be forgiving. And I like, even old King James, I think, says it this way. This is even harder. And I think the old King James, the original or whatever you want to call it, 1611 King James, says forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, forgave you. Oh, that even hits harder, right? Oh, yeah. I am forgiven. Why did Jesus forgive me? Because I'm the nicest, most lovable human being ever created. And he couldn't help himself. (laughs) Or I was the most pitied of all. And he said, I got to do something with. When was the last time you just simply forgave somebody? And I love it. I, sometimes I talk to people about forgiving and because they come in and they're just mad. And I go, you just forgive them. Not till they ask. Seriously? Why don't you just forgive them? No, you have to ask me first. Okay. We can have a miserable life. Isn't it fun just to let it go? One of the most convicting books I ever read, and I've brought this up several times because someone stole the book from me. It was John MacArthur's book on forgiveness. It's a great book. I've forgiven whoever stole it. <laughs> Somebody ripped, I, 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 why would you rip that book off? I have lent hundreds of books, never got one ripped off till that one. And maybe it's just so I could forgive. So, uh, now, by the way, people have bought me that book. I have several copies now because people, f- I'm tired of your story. Here's your stinking book, man. I'll buy one for you. It's not the same. Mine was highlighted. I had parts that I liked. But man, when I read that book, it was so, so convicting about thinking. And, you know, it, it was kind of like just this last part of this verse and, 200 and some pages. Why can't we forgive one another? What's the deal? What's the issue? Didn't Jesus talk to Peter about that? I love it. I love those guys because they were just like us. They were just a bunch of people doing lives. 12 guys like messed up to the hilt. I know, Lord, I'll forgive him seven times. Yes, because I'm magnanimous and I'm a caring individual. (laughs) Jesus is like, dude, stop. Why can't we forgive people? Think about why can't we? Because we become focused on self again. Do you know what they did to me? I'm sorry for what they did to you well, then I'm not gonna forgive them till they tell me they're sorry. You know who you're hurting? You. I've had two people who were angry deeply, and well, I've probably had more than that. I've probably had a multitude, but two people, well, three, but two that, two that, that I know that were deeply angry with me. And one, I didn't know till they came and told me that they'd been mad at me for five years. And that's kind of bad. I felt bad because here's what I said. Seriously, I didn't know. And then they were mad again. (laughs) We kind of worked through that. But then there was another individual that was an older person and we'd interacted some. And they were someone I considered a very mature Christian and I did something to make them mad, but I didn't know what. And I went to him and I said, what did I do to make you mad? Just tell me, let's work it out. I'm not mad. I go, well, that kind of tells me you are mad. You know, when someone stomps their feet and I'm not mad, yeah, I think you are mad. Nope, nothing. I wrote them something. Just write it down, tell me, I'll apologize. Nothing. 
10 years later, that person came to me. Oh, I was so mad at you. What good did it do not to deal with it for 10 years? Once again, it wasn't hurting me. I moved on, right? It's like I tried, and even the other person, I didn't even know I made mad, so that was kind of bad, I guess. But, but listen, my Bible says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. Take care of your side. Forgive people. And if somebody's not gonna do that to you, that's their problem. Don't be that person who's you're gonna stomp your feet and you're gonna hold a grudge and you're gonna do that. Just forgive them. But you don't know what they did to me. No, I don't. But I know what I did to my God and he forgave me. How could I not forgive anybody? So listen, I think all of this boils down to that. What are you willing to give up as a person to maintain a relationship in this body of believers called the church. Come on, saints, let's go. Because here's what I think, man. I think, again, I, I still think we're living in a great time. I think we have a great opportunity to be light in the darkness. And some people are going, do you know how crazy it is? No, I live in a bubble. <laughs> I don't see anything but good. Come on. And I'm thinking, we have an opportunity as a church. And as I've said, I think November is going to be an ugly, 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 ugly month. Are we going to shine? Let's go for it, church. Let's shine brightly, man. And let's do this stuff that we're reading. Let's not just read about it. Let's do it. And let's let people see this is what the church is. We're not a club. We're not a group that just has a, a little constitution that we live by. We're the body of Jesus Christ. Let's act like it. If your foot's hurting, the rest of your body compensates, right? Let's do that with one another. And it boils down to, I think, really caring about each other. Be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ forgave you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's stand up and pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your challenge for us, God. I thank you that just a few simple verses, seven, eight verses here, and yet so powerful and so challenging. I think we could, we could read them every day for a year and still not, completely absorb them and get them. And so I pray tonight, I pray, for, I pray for us here. Jesus, let us take to heart these things. And God, I pray most of all, and maybe this is just for me, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't brush them off. Oh, I don't do that. But God, we would be honest and sit before you and not evaluate ourselves so much as we would allow you, Holy Spirit, to check us out, to give us that exam. And God, most of all, that we would truly be men and women who glorify you and honor you with our lives by being the body of Christ. And I'm gonna ask you to stay in an attitude of prayer for a couple more minutes. And if you are here tonight and you've never given your heart to Jesus, probably reading this and going through this study was a, a little bit kind of foreign and, and a little bit hard for you. Well, you can change that right now. And I believe even if you, if you do that right now, the things that were said will come back to you. My Bible says that you have to have the Spirit of God in you to understand the things that, that God is saying. And, and so I want to give you that opportunity tonight to change your life forever. And by that I mean that you ask him, listen, you ask God to forgive your sins. He says, for God uh, in Christ has forgiven you. And all you have to do is call on his name. And, and by that, listen, when, whenever we say that, we mean you just got to be honest with him. You got to tell God that you know you're a sinner. I think that's the most important step right there, coming to the place where you know you're a sinner. And you're admitting it to God. I think all of us know we're sinners. But admitting it to God and then realizing that that sin can separate you from God. 
And uh, listen, here's what you need to do is ask him to forgive you. And my Bible says that, listen, Jesus died on a cross to forgive your sins. He went to the cross and paid a penalty that you owed. Now he offers you this full payment. Take it from him. Tonight is the time of salvation. So if you want that to happen, I'm gonna say a prayer. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer and kind of put words in your mouth. And you can say this prayer with me out loud. You can say it silently, but you gotta mean it. If you're watching online, once again, you've gotta, you gotta be that person. If you're, if you're at home, say this prayer. You don't have to be here in person. Call on the name of the Lord. If you're backslidden tonight, come home. Come back to Jesus. Say this prayer with us. Jesus, tonight I confess to you that I am a sinner. I'm sorry, God, that I sinned against you. And tonight I'm asking you to forgive me. Jesus, thank you for dying for my sin. Thank you tonight for your forgiveness. Right now, I want you to come into my heart and I want you to change me. Jesus, come into my life and guide me. Tonight, I'm asking you to be my Lord and my Savior.